Welcome to Ferment Radio, a podcast series on bacterial and social fermentation. Fermentation can incite social action, spark creativity and bring surprising new tastes to our lives. My name is Aga Pokrywka and I invite you to join us in a conversation on living interconnectivities, from macro to micro, from societal to cellular and from global to personal. garden. It invites us to sit down and watch things grow. It makes us work with gazillions of other species to make them flourish. Silent observation or site-specific mindful labor can be a form of wandering, seeing magic in what's common and perceiving what's repetitive with new eyes. This is how Nora Sandgren, a visual artist and art educator from Finland, works in her family garden. She collaborates with climates, insects, and expired light-sensitive material to create cameraless photographs of shared chemistry, of composting organic matter, microbes, human breaths, and sunlight. In this episode, Nora takes us to her garden, where she wanders while taking lensless images and patiently waits for long exposures for the magic to happen. Can you describe to us your garden, Nora? The garden space, uh, it is located in Heed and Vesi. And actually, I think just yesterday I was Googling again uh, what it, what this word means, Heezy. Uh, and if it has like a nice translation in English, but it didn't. It was translated into devil or a goblin. Uh, but I think it those don't really represent the Finnish feeling of it like it's um, it's something that used to uh, refer to like these sacred places uh, like t- at times before Christianity so uh, and there is like folk folk tales about uh, these creatures that would sometimes help people around uh <laughs> in the forest but they should also be respected but then there's the refresh reference uh also to um to specific spaces so i don't know maybe it's just just interesting thing also wow. also for me to think about like uh that just by coincidence our uh our sacred place is now located in in that uh kind of area so it's it's not actually that far away from Helsinki and uh I it's also not like uh even though it is a, a per- paradise sometimes but it's uh still in the middle of like uh a lot of human sounds and it's not like far away from all human traces or anything like that but um just a place for me to also have some distance from this city pace of life but i guess like you were asking about the the meaning and that kind of goes back in in my history quite long like f- far away back because um we always used to have like this allotment gardening place in in uh lo- located in Helsinki Central Park Forest there's specific places where people can do gardening and my parents always did that so i i have been growing <laughs> there playing <laughs> in the muds uh and soils of uh of that place but then uh we also had uh like my first garden was my grandparents garden and it was a place that uh they built like after war and i think it like now later on it's quite touching to think about that uh all those uh berries and apple trees were like also raising me up uh like they are part of my bodily chemistry and uh so it's like to ima- to imagine that after war they they were able to to do it to build a place of uh so so many different 
plants and like multi species place to live in and to uh, to to care and to be cared and to also concentrate on things like beauty so i think just in the context of like finland getting out of the war times uh it it it's still touching and uh it was like maybe uh now 13 years ago that uh, after they had already died that we couldn't like keep it because of like um this land has become so expensive in around Helsinki so uh there was this uh cleaning up of the uh, old all the memories that uh, that the place has had kept uh, and and that was kind of photographic to me that some uh, a spa- somehow it, that the space kept those smells and memories and now it was to be cleaned and ripped down and kind of given up but then there were also these really old uh or i don't know old but uh apple trees actually they are the uh, they were the age that i am now like in 40s and i remember each one of them and it was like really heartbreaking to think about that uh maybe like all all those times that they were cared for that uh they would be just chopped off and things would be built on it so i think uh it was very difficult to say goodbye to those trees and uh, yeah. so now there is like a housing there in yes, where the garden now used it, to be. N- now it's like yeah Wow. It is. It is part of this trend of uh, like building more densely. Yeah. So, but but I think like just um, saying goodbye to that place was hard, and it uh, also taught me just like probably quite many feel that when you are grieving for something, you are also so also some things become more clear. And to me, it was like this odd sense of. Uh, like how to grieve these other kinds of bodies than mine, that there are no funerals or no rituals for uh, those kind of bodies. And just like it took this many years <laughs> that that also the academia started to write more about the grievability of different kinds of bodies. But so from that grief, I think when we found this new place, my, they are, it's my parents' place, but uh, we coexist there with, with everything, <laughs> all kinds of beings. Um, but when when this new place was introduced, I think it felt very strange because, of course, something when you lose something, it is it's something unique and you cannot replace it. And I have like it is a very strange thing to deal with so I had this um, strong need of like situating myself and rooting myself to this new place and finding finding a a meaningful connection and like really start building relationships so uh, I think that was like the starting point for for (laughs) for the work in in garden that to understand that in order to build build a real relationship with the place or with other people or other uh, animals, we uh, we need to spend time and uh, like be together. Mm-hmm. So um, from from there, uh, this like sense of kinship and commitment comes from, and uh, then then you start to see everything that constructs the place uh it's not just a landscape like a general wor- word of landscape that but it's specific subjects that are making it up and you are in the middle of all this uh happening i know that uh one of the of your main mediums you are working with is photography or even like a um well lensless or cameraless photography right and 
Um, could you tell us more like uh, how your kind of a professional in a way or artistic medium interferes or is connected to the garden which you which you just described its history? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, my be- my like when it comes to my artistic practice, uh, like be- before art schools, I was uh, studying social psychology. So that I- that is like already thinking about how how we form our identities within social uh, connections and w- with our environments. So I think that was like important po- base. F- for me when I started to uh, study arts because then I was doing my thesis on uh, the the experiences of justice and even though it was within human uh, world then I think all that has affected quite a lot on my take on uh, how, how I think about photography so I think when I when you go to art school, you of course you are introduced with all types of all types of all genres of <laughs> all all the different ways that you can use your medium. But then at the end, you have to uh, also learn to look at your medium critically. And I think uh, for me, it was always very clear that photography was related strongly related to power. And uh, it just became like more and more clear to me that um, it's it's uh, that or it just started to tr- trouble me the the way photography uh, could like of course it, there's many kind of photographies uh, but to me it it started to become difficult uh, how to think about this representation and. Uh, and voice and uh how to think about how um photography could like take something you it was just so much about taking and shooting and capturing uh something out of the context and that could also create like this sense of distance that these things are somehow distant from from myself uh and also the problems of like one perspective uh when world is like multi perspectival and and multi essential um uh, and then the problem of like with with the representational quality that the, there is this um definition that comes so easily uh to somehow look like it's truth and it, it might help people to categorize, but then at the same time, when something is defined into something, there is this certain st- uh, stability uh, that was bothering me. That uh, that if, which is kind of analogical to words, also that when something get gets a name, then it seems that you <laughs> you now you know it. And if you if you can see it, you can research it, and you gain knowledge, you gain control, and uh, it can re- lead to like the and it has led to like con- colonialist practices and uh, exploitative practices. So and then at uh, always there is this um, this this notion that easily there is subject that is photographing something that suddenly is the object to be looked at and this subject of object relationship is also troubling me <laughs> because there is a hierarchy and there is the idea that the subject is the active agent and the object is somehow somehow could be resource uh, to be used or for me to be modified according to my intentions and of course like um uh, agency is a big part of photography and uh it's also this um culture that we live in that you are supposed to be branding yourself and carrying your things and representing your art but then what ha- what about if um like it's a quite heavy thing also mm-hmm. and 
and I am wired into more like this connectivity and and looking for connections and like interest into building relationhood. Uh, so then I think it was quite understandable that uh, uh, by lucky coincidence also that I found on my father's old uh, photographic papers that were like older than me and they were useless in a cardboard box and I think because of this like uselessness they were also somehow free because they they had been categorized somehow as waste and also because of this space uh, that was making me able to be playable <laughs> I think that I <clears throat> I started working with cameraless images like experiment with with plants and I would leave them uh on top of the papers outside and and under a glass and in the morning I would find them uh there would be humidity and uh this reddish color and it just resembled me of breathing uh and then I I think it was magical but I also thought that well I'm not sure about this like people of course they have been picking flowers forever but is it uh is there another way also for me to develop my own relationship to photography um uh, and then i i decided to put myself in the image and uh i created this score for myself that i would just be sitting with the paper uh m pressing my head head's weight on it and do nothing for 30 minutes and uh always work outside also, this paper, it quite cl quickly started to, I started to find like analogies to to my own skin, like th that we were, would both be sensitive, have like sensitive surfaces and be able to record traces of touch and different kinds of touch. And um, if I was sweating or crying, I I started to think about what does it mean that the that, that my chemistry is being uh, like um, sucked by the <laughs> paper that uh, we are exchanging chemistries that uh, what, is, what is the chemistry that also gets into my body through my lips maybe uh, that I hadn't think, think about before that what is the uh, photographic paper made of for example and uh, if it was something dangerous or toxic, then what would that mean? Mm -hmm. And and quite so, uh, within time, I think in this like quite intimate uh, connection make, making, I think photography also photograph started to become something uh, more as a specific beings with a lot of with different kinds of agency, agency that that I had been thinking before. So now it was something much more lively and uh, unpredictable and uh, wild. Now when I, you started to describe this process, uh, I realized that I cannot imagine, like, so you work with the with the, um, this photographic paper, and can you see the results quite quickly, or you still need to process somehow the the paper well when i have been doing these um slow breathing images that i named dialogue sometimes the time sen seems very long and sometimes very fast and when when the time has uh, time is up i just quickly like put the image away and i don't really look at it because uh of course i'm like i'm also protecting it from more light but yeah. but then I might leave it in a box for, uh, like I have some <laughs> some images that have been waiting for, uh, for my return for maybe, uh, yeah, since two thousand and fifteen, and so but but if I return to those, then uh, then I scan them. I don't use the chem the darkroom chemistry, like uh, originally. I was also a bit like afraid of that chemistry and the toxicity, like I could sense it. So that's why I decided to scan them. 
but um and then if if i scan an image and i meet it meet there's a new kind of meeting uh when it is digitized uh because it 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 is bigger on my screen and i can zoom in it so uh it's a very different kind of uh situation than just experiencing the process but the originals they keep on living and changing and fading away and it is important to me so the images that i am showing in in exhibitions usually have been kind of like slices from this process but it's the whole process that is meaningful and the liveliness of the image because probably when you when you scan the image it also kind of uh changes it right because scanner has a light when it moves through the image right yeah it's a, se- a second exposure time because yeah. uh it has the image has a long exposure time uh under sun but when when you scan it that's also different time than photographic time because it's it takes uh several minutes mm-hmm. for for the light to uh go through it yeah 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 uh, but and it is also destroying the image at the same time so it is re- making it more visible to me but destroying it so exactly. it's a paradoxical uh exposure so you kind of uh, you need to destroy it in order to document it or preserve it in a way because when it becomes digital like yeah uh, something gets it's dis- kind of frozen in time gets suddenly destroyed but something gets maybe also more visibility so mm-hmm, mm-hmm. of course uh w- when when an image is digitized it it's a whole different image in a way you work with a photographic paper you brief on it you you come close to it uh you put the plants from your garden on it but i know that you also uh work with your garden's compost and the paper itself does this process somehow differs from what you described? Yeah, I think the the compost was uh it's a it's a good example of what site specific site sensitive work means because uh if you spend time with with the place and you work with the place uh then then you are you are open to kind of perceive the offerings of the place and everything in it offers to you. So I think uh compost is a very natural thing to uh look more more closely to me because uh of course like garden is a is a place where you can see the material cyclicality uh happening all the time and compost is part of the part of that and uh it's something that is visi- visibly a place of uh like reci- reciprocity also that i am bringing my food waste to the compost and the compost uh with all its trillions of agents um uh, are producing for good um fertile soil that can help then plants to uh grow and be safe also from uh mm, like yeah bad <laughs> mm-hmm. bad agents so it uh it's like a something that is connecting me to soil very very concretely and and in our garden we have like very different kinds of compost there are these more dry compost for uh, the garden waste like uh uh weeds and stuff but then there are these uh compost that are more closed where we put our food waste uh and we are also bringing that from from the city to mm-hmm. there because we uh consider it valuable material and then there is the the how you call it the house house toilet <laughs> place mm-hmm. yeah which is also uh like that stuff is also being composted but mm-hmm. we don't put that into like veggies but sure it it produces a uh, very nice uh soil soil also but then here here at at uh, city i also have vermicompost and 
and bokashi. So, okay. So there are so many different kinds of compost. And vermicost <laughs> co compost is the one with worms, or uh, yeah, 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 with this. Uh, Red regular yeah. worms. Exactly. Yeah, which are different than the earthworms in the garden. But I think uh, the so this compost is also um, yeah, it is something that was like intriguing for me. I was curious to because I was building my relationship to photography and noticing that we uh, have like maybe very much shared history and evolution and how photography is related to con consumerism and then when you live with food waste and you look at the decomposing and uh, of of material then you start to think about where uh, where is this avocado peel coming from <laughs> and uh, what distance and what does it what does the surface contain um so so you start to think about what does food waste mean in in general and and when i looked up a percentage of the whole planet's like uh food production and food waste out of it it was uh pretty horrible mm -hmm. so so i think this is interesting like to think about the uh consuming and needs that the photo photographic uh photographs create for us and then to meditate it with the compost because uh, and and also these problems with that i mentioned with photography if i um, insert like this old photographic paper in the compost then there is like all this uh, tiny life uh, that are like specialized into deconstructing forms so I think it's really nice to uh, meditate, like how does the photographic paper uh, suit to to the material uh, cycle? I mean, it is very clear that this resin coated paper is not something that I want to eat. Mm. <laughs> and I also want to be kind to these uh, microbial co-workers. Uh, so I'm not leaving it there forever, but... I think it's been interesting to notice that uh, some fungi are able to uh, like ha inhabit the kind of more difficult, more toxic uh, environment and uh, even use it for for them for their growth. Yeah, so I'm interested in this. Um, yeah, what can I learn from their uh, abilities? And and anyway, like who are these uh, micro microbial agents that uh, also are part of my microbiota? So who who are these <laughs> tiny ones that I share my life with? And it's such a area of strangeness, uh, but then there's and sometimes also disgust, but. I think somehow it is in incredibly interesting to understand how little we understand of those. Mm. Like I I learned from somewhere that we only uh, have identified maybe 5% of all the fungi. It may be also a wonder since you are um, kind of capturing with the photographic paper... Uh, like a different, different, let's say, uh, actors, whether it's your breath or the microbes or whatever processes are happening in the compost, are they very different from each other, actually? <laughs> Sometimes I talk about the microbes as uh, creative writers because, of course, there is creativity. It's not just humans. Uh, tree. Uh, it's not just something that we only have, but... Uh, creativity within nature is that we belong in is like all the time happening I mean everything is being created recreated and and so it in a way it is no surprise that that it is so uh, so incredibly detailed and complex like it these images that I have 
collected from the compost process are the most complex images I have ever seen or been with. And they are complex in a totally uh, like bodily way, but also visually. Could you describe to us somehow those images? Yeah, like, of course, not. they are not always something that I would say that they are pleasing aesthetically. Like, I first, I have to say that they, I think when... I guess whenever you are cooperating with something something or someone else you have to become a little bit humble and be ready to work with your ideas about uh for example aesthetics. So sometimes uh they're not pleasing but I I think that is when I'm like have to negotiate more with the images. But um one time it was I think really touching to find this one one paper with the yellow uh, it looked like a tiny forest like if I would look at lift the paper and look it from from the side uh it would be s- like so dimensional three dimensional uh, and the yellow forest was I think it was magical I also have a feeling that the like the devices for for like capturing the reality they also change our experience of reality i'm for example imagining if we would have conversation here without those microphones would we talk differently you mm-hmm. know there's always it it's a however it's a kind of a non organic or you know it's it's an entity which is not alive and it's human made but it still kind of makes us mm. you know consider it and behave a bit differently Everything becomes more intimate when there is no me there is less mediating somehow between. But of course, like still mediating is we are now talking, like you said, through the this technology. And thanks to this technology things can be shared. Definitely. I really appreciated this what you said before about like a ritual, the power of ritual and how the repetition can also like um bring newer and like newer and newer reflections that if we would do the same thing but just once, it's a different thing that if we if we treat it as a series or as a yeah, ritual. And I kind of already presume, but correct me if I'm wrong, that many of the things you are sharing here with us are also kind of a, they came to you through that repetition and the rituals built uh around your garden and the cameraless photography which you are performing there but is there anything else kind of um which came through to you through that building the ritual with the garden capturing or like being with it through the cameraless photography when you slow down and start to repeat things it is like it is creating space for other other voices to be heard so uh that i would not be just stuck with my own intentions uh like trying to create something that i have already be already thought and already build a strategy to get some outcome so i think it's like a, a it's a real challenge to keep the process open ended so it ha- it's just this illusion that um that there is some knowledge that would be stable, that would hold. Because life is not like that. It is all the time moving and transforming. So uh, why not be more lifelike? Would you say that being a lifelike is being more fluid? I guess like fluidity also could be um, a photographic situation when you're looking at something too close maybe with a magnifying glass glass and things that first seem to be separate they their boundaries kind of become mixed and you find beautiful uh color gradients and you don't know anymore where something begins and something ends and so it's a, a situation that is like in flux yeah it's i <laughs> guess it's like a taking things in a different scale if we if we look at things from very far away, they also, the borders start to blur. I don't know, you look on planet Earth, like, can you mm. see the borders? Very few, I guess. And it's the same if you look through the microscope, suddenly many borders are gone. Maybe you see others, but uh, 
many are gone. Astronomers look through their telescopes and marvel at the expanse of the cosmos. They see countless stars and realize how insignificant humans are. Microbiologists zoom into their microscopes and marvel at the expanse of the human body. They see countless cells and bacteria and realize how incredibly intricate we are. The sense of wonder doesn't know the scale or limits. If you like this episode, please share it. If you would like to know more about the show, listen to this episode again, or find previous episodes, please go to fermanradio.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. We would love to know what you thought of this conversation, hear your human microbial stories, and your suggestions for the future episodes. We are always looking forward to hearing from you at hello at fermentradio.com. You can also leave us an audio message by connecting to us on our Instagram. Ferment Radio is brought to you by Super Eclectic. This particular episode was recorded during a residency at the BioArt Society Finland and supported by Microbial Life's Practices of New Human Microbial Cultures, a project at the center of the social study of microbes. I'm very grateful for this support and most of all with all our amazing Ferment Radio listeners. Keep fermenting and stay tuned for the next episode of Ferment Radio.